Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gunshin, and I am the Programs Coordinator at the Vancouver Maritime Museum. Thank you all for joining us for the first talk in our new program virtual series, Below Decks. Tonight's talk is about the SS Master, one of the oldest working wooden hulled steam power tugs in the world. This year, the SS Master is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that this program is taking place on the land that was once Sanak Village and the homes of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. It is important for us to acknowledge our role as settlers on unceded land and to continuously educate ourselves on how to better our relationship with our neighbors. To learn more on how you can be a better ally, visit our Learn page on our website. There, you will find a tab labeled Indigenous Resources where you can find information that will keep you informed on current issues. That link has just been sent to you in the chat below. Speaking of the chat, during tonight's talk, if you have any questions, please use the chat function at the very bottom of your screen. We will monitor your questions and discuss them at the end during our Q&A period. Tonight's talk is being given by Robert Allen a longtime steward of the SS Master and an absolute expert on tugs. This evening, Rob will highlight interesting features of the Master's design and talk a little bit about the evolution of tugboat design. He'll cover the tug transition from steam power, diesel to electric, and then talk about the SS Master Centennial Restoration Project. A third generation naval architect Robert comes from a family of ship designers. The Allen family has practiced ship design in Vancouver since 1919. Graduating from the University of Glasgow in 1971, Robert currently serves as executive chairman of Robert Allen Limited, a world leader in tugboat design. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rob. Hello. Thanks, Gatchin, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm just going to plug in my screen here and hopefully everything will work the way it's supposed to. There we go. Is that everybody seeing that? Looks good. Good. Okay. Well, welcome and, uh, and thank you for your, your interest in this uh, little show. I'm just trying to get rid of my little side screen here. Anyway, okay, we're good. Um, yeah, so th th this evening uh, we're, we're talking about the SS Master, which is the focus of a current exhibit at the Vancouver Maritime Museum. And I hope you will all take the opportunity to have a look at that exhibit and uh, see how it puts Master in context of uh, the, the de development of the British Columbia coast. Uh, it's a very well done exhibit and uh, shows a little bit about what tugs are about, which kind of what we're going to talk about uh, this evening too. So as, as Kanchan said, I, I get, to, because I give this talk, I get to give a 12 second commercial. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a third generation naval architect. The uh, family has been in working in private practice here since 1928, but my grandfather came to Vancouver in 1919 as a, as a naval architect and worked in local shipyards until going out on his own. So we've now been 94 years in business uh, with three generations of ownership. Uh, we're the designers of customized commercial vessels of all types. Uh, and, uh, but our, our biggest activity is certainly in the, in the field of tugboats. The company is now uh, fully employee owned and it's 100% Canadian. Uh, and we're very proud of that. And mostly uh, we, uh, we design tugboats. Um, we have more than 1200 tugs that have been built to our designs to date. Um, and, and they're scattered pretty much all over the globe and have been built all around the globe. I'm wondering how to get rid of this sort of screen bar. Can I get rid of this bar at the top? Is everybody seeing that little screen at the top? There's no screen at the top for us. Okay, 
it's just just my, and and the uh, participant bar is that on everybody's screen? Nope. There we okay. That's a little better. Okay, sorry for the interruption there. So we're here to talk about tugboats, and uh, you know, I I hope that uh, many of you like me uh, are are fans of tugs. They're they're quite unique in the world because they have fan clubs. They have dedicated magazines of many types. And, and they're the leading subject of maritime children's literature. I've, I've yet to find uh, a book written about Bertha the boat carrier or Tommy the tanker, uh, but, but tugs are forever a subject uh, of, of children's literature. And, and there are dozens and dozens of books written about tugs uh, in, in the real world. So they're they're a great subject matter. Uh, but tonight's talk is about the, the steam tug master. Um, as, as Kanchen said, uh, she is currently celebrating her centenary, having been built in Vancouver in 1922. She worked our coast for, for 40 years, doing the routine work of, of all tugboats, towing logs, towing barges, um, and moving product up and down the coast for, for her owners. Kind of a kind of a humble work, uh, but really essential and work that was critical to the development of this province and particularly developing the resource industries of the province. Uh, the, the master as a steam tug was kind of displaced by uh, the emerging diesel powered vessels uh, in the in the early 60s and she was kind of left to uh, dwindle uh, but she was uh, rescued by the SS Master Society um, and since 1962 so for 60 years she's been used as a showpiece and an educating tool uh, to let people understand the past history of the steam tugs of British Columbia. Uh, she's the last example of a working steam tug in British Columbia. And I have to correct Kanchen just a little bit because she is the only wooden hulled steam powered tug still afloat in the entire world. And I've canvassed all of my sources uh, that, that know a lot about the history of towing. Um, so uh, we can say fairly authoritatively that that statement is, is absolutely true. Um, so that's that's makes her more than unique. Um, she's is definitely the last of her kind here in British Columbia. She's a relatively sort of modest size, intermediate size tug at 85 feet. She's powered by a triple expansion steam engine developing 330 horsepower, and that turns a great big eight foot diameter open screw propeller. As I mentioned, she served the BC coast uh, for, for 40 years and was abandoned. Uh, the World Ship Society rescued her and uh, eventually got her raising steam again after a year of effort. And in 1971, that ownership was transferred to the newly formed SS Master Society dedicated to her care and, and attention. Uh, so the the focus uh, of this evening is about building the, the tugboat master and, uh, and how that happens. And we happen to have amongst the archives of the uh, master society, this copy of the builder's certificate that shows she was built by uh, Arthur Moskrop, who's a very famous name in local boat building here. He ran a little shipyard on Beach Avenue, just about where the aquatic center is, is right now. Um, and she was built for a Captain Herman Thorson, also of, of Vancouver. So there's all kinds of really good archival material in, in the records. Uh, a little bit about Arthur Moskrop, because his, his name does come up often in the early years of shipbuilding in British, here in Vancouver, particularly. He was born in England. I don't know exactly when he came to Vancouver, but uh, his earliest work shows up in the early 1900s before 1910. Uh, so he would have been probably in his earlier mid twenties when he, when he came to Vancouver. 
and he died here at a relatively healthy age of uh, 81 in, uh, in 1961. He's, he's listed in the, uh, in the records as a shipwright, which he absolutely was. Um, and probably his last employment was at Mackenzie Barge and, and Derek, later known as Mackenzie Barge and Marineways over in North Vancouver. Uh, he built 48 tugboats, 46 wooden scows and two freighters at that shipyard um, over a 27 year period. So pretty significant output. It looks like he probably ran into some financial difficulty in the dirty thirties and, and reconstituted his, his uh, shipyards uh, in 1932, but did relatively little work after that. One of his best known achievements is uh, in his, uh, probably during the years he was working at McKinsey Barge, he was seconded to Burrard Dry Dock Company to basically be the, the foreman uh, on the construction of the, of the St. Rock, um, which uh, is well known to everybody who knows the, the Maritime Museum. So this is Mosscroft's uh, output, uh, which was uh, very thankfully recorded for us by uh, the Nauticopedia work of John McFarlane. Uh, and we can see Master there in the upper right-hand corner, uh, just a little bit beyond the midway production. Um, it's also interesting to see that the kind of first half of his work was, was nearly all tugboats. Um, and uh, the second half of his output was much more kind of scow oriented, although he certainly did have a, a few tugs in the, in the late in the late 20s. Uh, but I guess he was running into more competition at that time as well. But some of the some of the names in this list are, are very well known in the in the records of uh, the British Columbia tugboat industry. So how did he build the master? Um, was there a plan? Were there plans? Uh, well, we're gonna explore that a little bit uh, because the best laid plans in the words of Burns, gang after glay. And the truth of the fact is that there, if there were, original plans for the master, they no longer exist. Um, and, but I thought in today's world, the very last verse of Burns' poem that uh, talks about that, which is a poem called Tea Moose, um, ends with, with words that I thought uh, were kind of fitting for what's going on in the world today. And they have absolutely nothing to do with tugboats, but uh, and forward though, I kind of see it. I guess, and fear. So um, I just thought that was pertinent uh, for what we're looking at today. So normally a shipbuilder would start with a lines plan. Uh, so this, uh, because we don't have the original lines of master, uh, this is a drawing taken from our corporate archives uh, from not so very long after, 1937. For a, for a 52 foot wooden tug. This is normally what, uh, what a shipyard would start with. The, the lines plan that defines the geometries, essentially a contour map of the hull of a ship in, in all three views. Um, and, and that's what they would begin with. Um, then they'd probably do an arrangement drawing uh, like this one on the left and, and a structural drawing that shows how it's all supposed to go together like the one on the right. So these are these two drawings are for the same boat, but they're not the same as the, the one for the lines plan, although not terribly different uh, either. But so, and, and the construction of a wooden tug like this is very much like uh, what the, uh, the master is like. Um, so it's a uh, pretty, pretty straightforward wooden construction. So that's what one would expect to We've seen, um, and boats in this area era were built with not many more drawings than that. Something defining the hull geometry, something defining the arrangement, and something defining the basic construction and and the primary machinery. Our records are full of dozens and dozens of plans for very successful boats that were built with not much more definition than that. 
And the outcome were vessels like this one, Hayek. This is, this is the boat for which that earlier lines plan uh, was shown. She was built in 1937 uh, for a fellow named Sparky New, who was a very famous character around the waterfront for, for many years. So Mosscrop probably started with using the traditional method of, of a half model. And uh, half models today are generally considered more decorative than they, than they were functional. And they're most often seen for famous sailing yachts and whatnot, or in this case, um, a famous old British steam tug. But the, the example in the upper left is a little more rustic and, and could well have been uh, an original shipwright's work. And, and they would be trained enough to understand the shape that they wanted to achieve and use that to, to create uh, the geometry that they wanted. So once that was finished, they would then loft those lines to, to full size. And that work was done in the loft, uh, what shipyards refer to as a mold loft. They would lay out the lines on, on a painted floor and then use battens and uh, thin veneer wood to, to create patterns for the shape of, of every frame. And once they had all of those um, patterns completed, ready to go, then they would turn that over to, to the shipwrights uh, and uh, all of these frames would be built to those patterns and then the planking and everything else would, would go on. So this, this is how ships were built for centuries. Um, and in fact, how many smaller wooden boats these days still are, are built. Uh, things haven't changed very much in this regard from the time of the Vikings. Uh, so whether the boat is large or small or simple or fancy, that, that technique, that basic wooden boat building construction for the keel and ribs and planking um, is what keeps them all together. Um, and it seems to work pretty well because people keep, keep doing it. But in the case of the master, we have to work backwards because we didn't have those drawings to start with, or at least we have no record of them. Uh, and it's unclear what Mosscrop may have done with his business files, uh, if in fact he did have any drawings. I expect he didn't uh, because he was a very skilled shipwright um, and knew what he was doing and uh, just did it. But in the case of the master, you know, we have the tug um, and then we have a group of very dedicated people in the society that started creating drawings to record what this ship looks like. And they started that by doing a whole bunch of little simple sketches uh, that we have in the society's ar archives. So men with pencils and tapes and notepads crawled through the ship and, and made lovely little sketch drawings like this showing where everything is. Uh, so we've got the, the basic general arrangement of the boat here on a, on a little sketch. We've got typical construction details uh, here. Um, we've got detailed drawings of the, of the boiler. Um, and then we've got diagrams for the various fuel systems and, and there are a few more. So um, yeah, the people that love this boat uh, did a really good job of detailing exactly uh, how the systems were set up and how the boat was built. Uh, but the purpose of many of these was ultimately to build a really high definition model of the master. So having lifted the geometry of the boat directly off the boat when she was up on the ways at one time, they worked backwards and, and created uh, the, the lines plan, which as I've said before, would have been the original starting point, but here it's kind of the halfway point. Uh, so we've got a profile and the, and the water lines through here. Um, the next drawing shows the sections through the, through the length of the hull and a shape. And uh, then this all got put together into kind of a lovely little drawing that shows the, 
uh, geometry of every frame throughout the length of the boat in a kind of an unusual presentation, but it gives a really kind of lovely sort of 3D impression of the boat and some of the structural details. But these structural details are for the building of the model. So they're slightly different than what one would see for the, for the actual boat. But the process um, and the type of drawings are kind of exactly what one would have expected to see originally. And then there would have been uh, an arrangement drawing like this showing where all the cabins are and all of the details and the outfitting and the rigging and, and so forth and the propeller and rudder, uh, those would all come. Uh, but the output from those drawings that uh, were created by the, the skilled observers who went on board is, is this lovely 42 inch long model um, that is presently on display in, in the Maritime Museum along with a whole bunch of photographs and some lovely artwork uh, talking about the steam tugs of British Columbia. Uh, so take it in and have a good close look at, uh, at Master because it's, uh, this really is a lovely model. So the, the next set of drawings that were created, uh, a part of the education aspect of, of the master, um, this sort of arrangement drawing, and you can see the similarities between this and the uh, pencil sketch that, that were drawn. And you can see that almost the entire hull of this boat is taken up with machinery with the, the exception of the little crew foc'sle space uh, down forward. She's got uh, big fuel tanks up forward, her big scotch boiler right amidships, and then the triple expansion steam engine after that, um, and various uh, oil and water tanks and so forth in there. So there's not much room for anything in there. She's, she's all business. Um, and the galley and uh, crew cabins and whatnot um, up, up above. But the gem of the post-construction drawings uh, about the master is this lovely sort of cutaway drawing that practically shows everything about, about this boat. It certainly shows all the important parts. You get a good impression of the, the, the structural elements uh, of the boat uh, in, through this bit of cutaway here, uh, showing all these sistered frames. Um, you, you see the boiler uh, in here, the big steam engine, and the, the other, everything on this boat is driven by steam. So the, the big towing winch aft is driven by steam, the anchor windlass up forward, driven by steam. Um, and I, there's even, even steam involved in, in the steering uh, elements of the, of the ship. Uh, so yeah, just a, a lovely drawing, uh, of course, after the fact, but uh, really a uh, real, real work of art and uh, showing all the critical bits. So the, the master and, and her like uh, became the source of some national recognition a few years ago. Uh, in, uh, I think 2014, uh, we finally convinced the national government that uh, master and her like were worthy of recognition. And uh, in true bureaucratic form, they're unable to identify um, the, uh, a movable object as a, a national monument or whatnot. So they decided that towboating and tugboats of Canada's West Coast could be designated an event of national historic significance. So we'll, we'll accept that. Uh, we, we got the recognition um, and we got a very lovely bronze plaque, which is presently uh, mounted down at Granville Island, uh, commemorating that coastal history and in particular referencing the, the master. So when you're next down on Granville Island, go down to the west side of the, uh, um, the market and, and you'll see this little stand and this whole little uh, uh, mention about the importance of towboating to the, uh, uh, the development of the British Columbia coast. Um, when she was 
still raising steam, the master would spend her summers at Granville Island and uh, she's uh, in the shop for some repairs at the moment. So she hasn't been able to get down there for a couple of years. And we hope that uh, when we are raising steam again, that she will get back there because it's a great place to show her off to the many visitors that come through there. So that's kind of where Master is today. I want to talk a little bit in the time that uh, I've got remaining here, which is rapidly disappearing, um, about the business of designing tugboats, which is kind of what our company does. It's my grandfather and my father who were active throughout the 50s and 60s. Everything they did was manually done with battens and French curves and all the calculations were done by hand and with slide rules and planimeters. Pretty much the same thing was going on in larger shipyards. Uh, they were just building larger ships and they had longer boards uh, on which even two people could, could work at a time. But the process was exactly the same. Everything was hand drawn and hand fared. Uh, and it's, uh, it was a, definitely a, a skilled profession. Today, everything's done by computer uh, and uh, certainly less romantic. Uh, but a great deal more accurate. And, and the output of that doesn't have quite the romance of those old hand-drawn drawings, but they again are, are much more accurate and effective. And this is the sort of tugboats that we're designing today, uh, much bigger, much more powerful, all steel of course, and designed for often quite different tasks than the sort of uh, general towing service that Master was doing. Uh, so we produce all those arrangement drawings, detailed schematic drawings, uh, arrangement drawings of critical elements. Um, we're doing a great deal more um, design work than was the case before. So a design package for a modern tug today probably consists of 50 or 60 drawings. And when that goes to the shipyard, most shipyards today are going to turn that into a 3D complete detailed model like this so that they know where everything goes before they start building everything. Uh, but this creates the digital patterns for everything that they have to do because the process of building today is a great deal different than it was even sort of a generation ago. Uh, but you can imagine the amount of work that has to go into creating uh, a model, a model like this. But it shows up every conflict, and you solve all of the problems in a digital space before you get into the the actual vessel and have to decide whether the wire goes here or the pipe goes here. We have some amazingly powerful tools today at our disposal for designing and optimizing the design of um, many new vessel types. Uh, we use uh, very exotic programs. Uh, the illustration on the left there uh, is an example of computational fluid dynamics where you can fully model the flow around any body in the water. Um, and understand exactly how it's behaving. So it's an extremely powerful and valuable tool. In a similar vein, we have finite element analysis uh, with which we can really refine um, and analyze uh, structural elements so that we're sure we're avoiding any, any failures in that area. Um, and ship production today is very different than it was, well, you know, modern shipyards are fully enclosed, they're clean, they're safe environments. Uh, you know, you, you just don't see the sort of rubbish that you used to see in, uh, in older shipyards. And uh, there's still, of course, you know, a lot of traditional skills like uh, welding and, and fitting that are, that are necessary. But increasingly, uh, we're seeing really uh, advanced technologies being used in the shipyards. Um, and the, the skilled workers in the yards are the people that operate these machines that, that do the work. So we see a, a frame bending machine here on, on the right, uh, where that bending pattern is, is all programmed. And we have a fellow here operating a, a cutting machine, cutting out uh, all of the parts that are predefined in that three-dimensional model. 
uh, and and shipyards, uh, not all, but but many are their production factories now. Uh, you know, this is one of our clients in Turkey, who builds 25 to 30 tugboats a year, and they're not all the same. They're all different, but uh, you know, they're they're on a production line. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a real treat to see how smoothly that, that all goes. And then ultimately when they're finished, it goes out the door and into the water uh, and, and goes to work a short time thereafter. So um, one of the things I'm often uh, challenged by is people think that tugboats are all the same and they're like those little things you see towing logs around in the river. Um, but they do come in many shapes and sizes and they're not all doing the same thing. So I'm just gonna kind of briefly touch on that because um, what a tug has to do really defines what it looks like. And uh, so we categorize our uh, tug designs uh, generally by these categories here, typical coastal towing that you see locally here. Uh, much bigger variations of that for ocean towing of uh, big rigs and uh, rescue towing at, at sea and salvage. Uh, ship handling in ports, uh, terminal support, which is kind of ship handling, but in more exposed areas. Tanker escort is an increasingly important aspect of that work. Smaller line handling tugs for getting ships onto the berth, and then all different kinds of river transportation. So, Here's just some examples of the typical tug and barge uh, systems that, that you'll often see. Um, tugs and barges on the coast of BC. On the lower left there is a pusher tug, which locks into the stern of a barge and pushes it. So the whole thing becomes an integrated unit. Um, and then we have uh, big pusher tugs with uh, convoys, uh, 50,000 tons of iron ore convoy there. Uh, in a South American river system. So these are all just examples of tugs at work. Uh, ship handling is what you see in the port of Vancouver here on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but in a offshore setting, you know, we'll call that a terminal support tug because they have to be able to do that sort of ship handling work in much rougher conditions and uh, handling generally bigger ships. Tanker escort uh, really started in the early to mid 90s after a series of uh, severe tanker incidents around the world, including the Exxon Valdez and a whole new generation of tug designs developed, um, being able to exert really high steering and braking forces on ships that are working in confined areas. So that's been a really exciting development for the last 20 years or so. And, and continues to be one of the most important aspects of tug design and tug construction today. The conditions in which these boats work are often very challenging, uh, but they're the, they're the tow trucks and the rescue boats that get called first if, when other ships get in, get in trouble. So they have to be able to go out in some pretty awful stuff and, uh, and they do it well. The, the typical tugboat today has what we call Z-drive propulsion. These are 360 degree steerable propellers uh, surrounded by a thrust augmenting nozzle. Uh, and they're, they're nearly all diesel powered today, although as we're gonna see shortly here, that's, uh, that's starting to change too. Uh, and our fundamental uh, driving uh, criteria in all of this is making these boats safe um, safe for the owners, safe for the crew that, that work on them and able to do their job well. So we have, we have a lot of different criteria that we have to follow, um, but uh, it's, not, it's not hard to achieve if you keep your wits about you. Tugs have changed and tug design has changed a lot over the years, as we saw with, with the master in the, in the early years and up until, even up until the mid to late 50s, um, people were still building, building wooden tugs, but steam engines pretty much kind of ran the course um, by the, the end of the Second World War. Um, and uh, they were being replaced by, by diesel uh, at, at that time. So with a lot, quite a few wooden 
diesel powered tugs, um, but there were literally hundreds of wooden hulled steam driven tugs uh, here operating in BC uh, before the Second World War. By, by late in the 50s, uh, wood was really giving way to steel very quickly and, and diesels had completely replaced steam. And these are all examples of 1960s uh, vintage, early, early to mid 60s vintage steel diesel power tugs of various sizes. Um, but uh, today uh, we're into a, another sea change. Uh, it hardly seems like 14 years ago, but we actually designed the world's first hybrid powered tug for the port of Los Angeles and, and Long Beach for the, for the Foss towing company down there. Um, one of their dolphin class tugs, um, not dissimilar to the Cates tugs that uh, were early here in the port of Vancouver. Um, this was a trend setting design. The technology has evolved a great deal since uh, but, but hybrid tugs have become relatively commonplace. Uh, and today we're seeing all very sorts of variations on that. We have uh, fully electric tugs under uh, construction. Uh, we have LNG powered uh, tugs, um, although they're less common uh, because LNG requires a great deal of space. So you can only do that in quite a big tug. Uh, and, and all sorts of variants of uh, uh, hybrid technology. Uh, so there are, uh, I think, two big escort tugs, uh, which will be um, dual fuel, LNG and, and diesel powered, uh, which will come here to BC in about another 18 months um, for, um, the uh, Kitimat um, LNG development, uh, LNG Canada, and four all electric ship handling tugs, um, which uh, will be, they're not exactly the first in the world, but they're certainly amongst the very first in, in the world that are, that are all electric. So really quite exciting development that we're looking forward to seeing here. I'd like to kind of close by talking about saving the master because uh, she's a hundred years old and uh, she's in need of some tender loving care. Um, and those of us in the master society are working hard to, to make that, that happen. But why should we bother? So a lot of people ask that question. Uh, why should we bother with old boats? Because if we don't, uh, they're gonna end up like the lovely old sea lion that just uh, within the last month or two uh, was taken apart uh, over a dock in Nanaimo. So here she is kind of hauled up. Uh, they're starting to cut holes in her, ready to taking her apart. Uh, and then she was gradually just kind of nibbled away down to basically just her keel left standing. And that is all that remained of a tug that was built in 1906 um, and served this coast in various guises for over a hundred years. Uh, we're not gonna let that happen to the master. So we have a centenary project. Um, she is an absolute original. She's not a replica of anything. She was not converted to diesel as many were. She's still in her original form as a working tugboat. Uh, and there are more than a few around that have become tug yachts but at which point they cease to be a tugboat. And we estimate that she's at least 80% original in her hull and, and machinery. She's had obviously some repair work done over the years, but absolutely unique as an example of a working wooden steam tug. Uh, we wanna use this centenary to uh, initiate a, a full-blown restoration so that she'll last at least another generation, because she is such an important symbol of our coastal heritage. And she will, in that role, be used to pay tribute to what that towing industry has meant to the economy and the development of British Columbia, and to use her as a tool for teaching about the history of the coastal, coastal industries and how they developed and to celebrate the founders and the pioneer of, of the towing industry, British Columbia. 
but these old boats need a lot of love and care. There's a lot of routine activity that has to happen. Um, and there's also some major long-term restoration that, that needs to happen. And that's really what we're talking about today. There are major structural repairs, major machinery repairs that need to happen. We get great support uh, for the master from our local shipyards and C-SPAN's Vancouver shipyards in particular. Just over a year ago, they, they had her up for shave and a haircut and an inspection and some, some new bottom paint. Uh, and it was really interesting to see how uh, this group of people in that shipyard just uh, were drawn to this lovely old wooden tug and they, uh, they were great fans. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, her support. Um, and uh, we, we hope we can continue to count on that. There are lots of things you can do with old boats. And in my travels, I've encountered a few. Some of them are just kind of left to rot away on the beach in various guises. And some of them are kind of sitting on the beach and made into so-called attractions that you, you can't get aboard. And, and other people do other things with them that are perhaps more functional, but you really have to depend on the watertight integrity of the boat if you're gonna use it for the roof of your house. Uh, some of the more important vessels in British Columbia have been saved and they put into dry land storage as landlocked exhibits, um, which is fine if that's the best that we can do. Um, but there's nothing like a real alive working vessel in the water um, and making her own way around um, being loved and, and well-maintained. So our goal with this centenary project is to raise about $3 million. And with the price of wood doing what it is, we might have to upgrade that uh, to, to do this whole restoration project. Ideally, after that, we'd like to establish an endowment fund so that the ongoing work of looking after master is not such a struggle. And we need the committed support of as many members of the public as possible to make that happen. And we need a lot of industry backing and, and support from government. Uh, so we need everybody to, to pitch into that. And then, you know, we, we're not gonna start this hard work until we're certain that we have the financial wherewithal to do it. Um, underwater, the master is actually in remarkably good shape. There's a little bit of work that needs to be doing there, um, but, but not a great deal. There's a lot more work needs to be done topsides, uh, because rain and sun are actually more damaging to, to boats than uh, being fully immersed in water. And that's, that's where the worst wear is, particularly on the decks and, and so forth. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do up top. Um, quite a lot of work uh, on, the, on the boiler and uh, the engine's in reasonable shape, but uh, she needs some, some work too. Um, and and the, all, of, all of the machinery needs kind of upgrades and the propellers could uh, use a little uh, fixing up as well. So she needs, she needs a lot of work. So wouldn't it be lovely if there was a sugar daddy to, to make that happen who would give us $5 million and say, go to it guys. Or even if we had half of the people of British Columbia who each donated $1, we'd be almost there or one-tenth of the people who donated just $10, then we'd be there. It's, it's remarkably easy when you look at it that way. We just have to get in touch with those 50,000 people. Um, but we also need our governments, both in Canada and British Columbia, to recognize our maritime heritage um, and, and make provisions for their preservation and, and restoration. So in, in that context, I really would urge everybody that's here um, to go to the SS Master website, uh, write to your MPs and MLAs and urge them to create a provincial or a national maritime heritage designation for the best of BC's uh, wooden vessels and particularly for the Master. Um, she's a gem, she's in really good shape. Um, but she needs a lot of attention now before it becomes too late. 
I thank you for your indulgence. I'm just one minute over time here. Thanks to the Maritime Museum for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the master and, and my first love of tugboats. Uh, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so, so much, Rob. That was absolutely incredible. I did not know that much about the SS master. Um, so you'll be sure that I have a lot of questions for you as I'm sure everybody else in the audience does as well. Um, but I just want to start off with a really easy one uh, for you is what is it about the SS master? I mean, I've heard so many people, uh, especially in this last week with the exhibition going up talking about how they have this memory of being on the SS master at Granville Island. They went to it as a kid. What is it about this specific tug that drew you in? And you think draws in others? Well, I, I'm. My entire career has been built around tugboats, so I mean, I just there's there's something magic about tugs. Uh, you know, they're they're kind of the common man of the sea. You know, they're they're generally not fancy, um, and and they're hardworking, rugged rugged boats. And I think that gives them kind of a broad societal appeal, but. When you, when you marry that kind of work boat uh, draw with, with wood and steam, then, uh, you know, you, you can't resist. You absolutely can't resist. Uh, you know, there's, there's something magic about wooden boats, uh, you know, particularly when you're building them and you smell the yellow cedar and whatnot. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and, and the steam is a huge draw. I mean, you know, they're, they're, I am by no means this, an expert on steam at all. It uh, predates my technical education. Um, but rather than having a puff of gasoline and, and diesel fuel, just the, the hiss and puff of the, uh, of the steam engine is magic. But Master has been educating the public about that magic for 60 years. You know, that, that's why we, she's so well known. She's, she's the only real tug left of that type. And she, until just very recently when we were having problems with the boilers and not being able to get steam up, uh, she's been going around to boat shows and being at Granville Island leading tug parades. Um, so she's a, she's an absolute gem, and she's a beautiful boat. You know, she's a handy size, um, lovely classic shear line, um, lovely colors, and and you can see the love that the members of the SF Master have lavished on her. You know, that's that's an absolute tribute to those people. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had a comment that said Rob's pitch is irresistible, which I absolutely agree with. I think we should just send money. Send money. <laughs> <laughs> send this recording to the our MLAs. Sure. I think this could definitely win them over. <laughs> um, you mentioned the smell of the wood. So we had a question is what kind of woods are in the master? I think uh, the master is nearly all Douglas fir. Um, you know, that was, she was, uh, that was the most common shipbuilding uh, wood here in, in BC because it was so plentiful and it, I mean, it's, it's really an ideal boat building wood unless you're trying to go for lightweight, which you're certainly not trying to do uh, in a tug, but, but fur is, is a very strong wood, but it's an easily worked wood. Um, and it's, it's not as rot resistant as, as cedar, but it's a great deal stronger than cedar. Um, but properly treated and, and, and cared for, um, it, it will last a yeah, hundred years and, and more. Uh, you know, the, the age of a boat is all about the maintenance. It's not about the original construction. It's all about maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so master has been well maintained. But yeah, uh, uh, virtually every, you know, the, the cap rails on the bulwarks are probably mahogany or something like that. And there are little bits of hardwood here and there. Uh, but, but by and large, uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that she's all Douglas fir. Uh, we have somebody in the audience who's a carpenter and they were wondering um, about bringing the boat to Steveson uh, uh, to work with the Wooden Boat Builder Society. Is that 
something that's been done before or ever been brought up to the society? Um, I honestly don't know whether that has happened or not. Um, but you know, we we do we work with a fellow named Dave Sharp, who's a very skilled uh, shipwright, um, younger fellow, but but very very skilled, um, and he's kind of our go-to guy for for repairs. Um, but um, you know, reach uh, reach out to me, reach out to the society. You know, if if you have people that have uh, woodworking skills or machining skills or steam engine skills um, we we would love to have you uh, join the society and and work on it this is obviously the more volunteer work that we can do on on this the the better um, and uh, you know that will save us a little bit of little bit of money but it needs to be done professionally you know the the scale of work is is quite large uh, it's not daunting but it it it's going to take some money. It's, it's beyond the realm of what we as volunteers can manage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have a couple of questions about your presentation today. Mm -hmm. You talked about the, the differences now in the ship designs from the past to present. Um, what do you think are the pros and cons of that? Are there any cons of the way things are being designed today? Have things been lost or improved? <laughs> Well, what's really different mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, there, there no longer are, are people like Arthur Mosscroft, these um, highly skilled shipwrights who just, you know, they were born into this business of how you build a ship. And, and they could work from my grandfather's four little plans and say, oh, yeah, I know exactly what to do with that. And they would go away and do it. Those people are all gone. Um, and even in modern shipyards, you don't find those skill sets anymore. So now we're doing those highly detailed 3D models. All of those parts get cut on numerically controlled burning machines um, and they get marked and they go together like little Lego kits. So the skill level that's required to build a ship is actually a great deal less than it was a generation or two generations ago. It's, and that's not to say that they're lesser skills, but they're, diff they're very different skills. Um, so it's a much more automated process. Um, and because there are fewer and fewer people going into sort of shipbuilding, um, it's increasingly a, a highly automated uh, process. So yeah, it's, it's, it's just change. Uh, you know, it's neither better nor worse. Uh, but you do find centers of excellence in wooden boat building in some areas, you know, places like Port Townsend. Uh, and even here in sort of Vancouver and throughout the Gulf Islands and Victoria, there are little clusters of people who love wooden boats, but they're mostly building small rowboats and kayaks and small pleasure craft and the odd one who you know builds a bigger bigger wooden boat but it's hard to get the materials that you need um, and but there's still there's something magic about building a wooden boat maybe you should lead that project at the maritime museum i can see you outside in the parking lot building a big tug well i don't know about that i don't know getting i'm way too old way too old <laughs> Speaking of the future, you talked about greener energy. Is that where you see the, the future of tugboats being using all green energy? Um, you know, it's, it's the future of all shipping. Um, the uh, International Maritime Organization has basically decreed that by 2050, international shipping should be uh, emissions free. Uh, so that's not so very far away. That's that's one generation. That's uh, you know we're uh, we're well into the 2020s now, and uh, uh, so if you consider what that means, converting the entire ocean-going fleet mm -hmm. to uh, non-polluting propulsion in 36 years, 
Um, that's an enormous amount of work in shipyards. So some of that will be conversions. Some of it will have to be kind of complete replacement. Um, and that's just the ocean going fleet. Uh, but every maritime jurisdiction that I can think of, and we've been working actually uh, with the provincial government for the last year on strategies that are looking at this. So yeah, um, tugs, fish boats, pleasure craft, um, passenger vessels, everything uh, will come under this change. Uh, and, it's, and it's going to be very, very significant. There are challenges with the fuel supplies for the alternatives that we're looking at. Uh, is there enough lithium in the, in the world to enable all these batteries to be built? Not everything can be electric. Um, you know, electric can work for harbor tugs. It, it's totally impractical to consider using that for a line haul tug that's going up and down the coast for multiple days at a time. Um, but there are alternative fuels that, that could be used. So it's a, it's a really exciting time from a naval architect's point of view, because you've got the, the whole world of all of these options in front of you and, and making the right decision is, uh, is quite a challenge uh, at the moment. So yeah, no, it's, the, it's absolutely where the future is. Oh, sounds like an exciting one. Um, you, you just mentioned a while back about that there's not enough people going into this industry, that you're not seeing enough. Why do you think that's happening? I, um, to, a, to a large extent, well, certainly locally, um, you know, the shipbuilding industry was in pretty serious decline from, yeah, even the, even the mid 80s uh, through until just a few years ago with the start of the national shipbuilding strategy and the kind of rebirth of shipbuilding at Vancouver shipyards. So, you know, it, there, was, there was no attraction in there for, for young people because they couldn't see a future. Um, but, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, what I've just outlined with all of the alternative propulsion, um, and, and the work that the federal government has planned, that you know, BC Ferries has planned, the, the future for shipbuilding actually in British Columbia and, and just about everywhere is actually brighter than it's been, not at any time in my career, but certainly for, for a long, long time. Um, and so we're, we're actively looking at ways, and then when I say we, I'm talking on behalf of the Association of BC Marine Industries uh, with which I'm heavily involved. But uh, we're, we're really starting a program of outreach uh, into, into schools and university to make this, that younger generation aware that, you know, there are, uh, you know, really interesting, uh, really challenging um, full-time career opportunities in, in the marine profession, uh, in shipbuilding and ship design and machinery component design. Uh, all, all sorts of opportunities. So we're, we're hoping that we will, uh, you know, light some fires and, and get, get a new generation into this before all of us old gray hairs are completely gone. <laughs> I can imagine. Okay, if you had to say one thing to convince a young person to get into this industry, what would you say? <laughs> uh, well, I, I wouldn't encourage anybody to go into this industry if you don't have a real serious interest in boats. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's a, you've got to have some passion for, for this work. You know, it's, it's highly creative, um, highly challenging, um, very demanding, um, but, you know, to, I can't think of anything more rewarding at the end of the day, when you have an idea and you put it down on paper and you make it work and see it get translated into a working living vessel. And then you, you see it running around the Harbor doing work for you, you say, I did that. That's, that's as good as it gets. Uh, and, you know, I bump into my tugboats all around the world and that's even better. Yeah. So uh, go for it.
perfect. So be a naval of- architect, be a shipwright, <laughs> you know, be a machinist, be a welder, um, but have fun doing it and do it, do it with boats. Mm-hmm. So all of you out there who know some young people, you've heard it from all, Rob. This is how you convince somebody to be a naval architect. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for your questions this evening. I think it's time to wrap up. We're only two minutes over, so perfect. Um, thank you again, Rob, for giving that wonderful presentation. And yeah, like Rob pleasure. has mentioned at his end of his presentation, there are many different ways that you can get involved in this project talk to your local MPs and MLAs, learn about the SS Master, and also get involved in, in, in this project. This is your local heritage, and it's really important to know about it. So if you are interested in learning more about some of the boats and are interested in ships, for example, we have another program coming up on April 20th at 7 p.m. And this time we will be looking at the ship plans of the Empress of Japan. The presenter will be Cliff Pereira, who is right now stationed in Hong Kong. Um, If you're also actually interested in looking at ship plans itself, uh, that is very possible. Uh, You can contact our librarian archivist, Ashlyn Prasad, and her email is archives at vanmaritime.com. So if you're interested in checking out some plans or want to see our archives, uh, just shoot her an email. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Um, We really enjoyed having you here this evening, and we hope that you've learned a little bit more about the SS Master and about your local Vancouver, BC history. Uh, Have a great night.